more specific liberal arts context. After years of studying a variety of sociological approaches to the digital realm and advertising, I found interesting relationships that permeated through these separate structures. They were encapsulated in uniquely digital ways. Free Kwame is an attempt of local artists and writers to facilitate their social ties and network on a platform that is unique to them. It is further an attempt to foster fulfilling and dynamically enriched social spaces online. Kwame is unique in the sense that it had a specific tar target audience and its marketing sequence reflected the political events at the time of its generation. It was related to the types of conversation that were popularized by young college students in Michigan at the time. Its structural reflects these atemporal concerns. There's an intertextual mediation between the language of the Post and the news reports of Kwame Kilpatrick. Furthermore, the site was created using techniques of a rapid-fire interfacing as well as capitalizing upon the contributions of artistic cooperatives. Part of the success of Free Kwame's generation is that the market for artists is so conflicted. Basically, the market is tempered by a media mashup. The market for guerrilla marketing by artists for artists is mediated by media conglomerates. This can potentially alienate an audience comprised of purists who know that identifying with larger corporations due to the political trends could hamper the reception of their music by their fan base. Their self-promotion and then its distribution on sites such as Pitchfork or other elite reviewing services can break as much as make a musician. Furthermore, as demonstrated in the second bullet point, independent organizations face competition with the fact that everyone is marketing themselves on social media platforms. In this sense, the cloud is crowded with the confluence of new media voices. In order to somehow infiltrate and isolate individual threads of thought, it's important to do an analysis of what's trending. We see a paradoxical correlation between mainstream media and populations traditionally seen as the most resistant to distributed, distributed information loops, i.e. the modern artists. As cited in a recent Web Pro News profile, College kids 18 to 24 made up the fastest growing segment of users on Facebook last year. Despite the fact that Gawker recently referred to the startup diaspora as the Facebook killer, this phenomenon shows that youthful populations can indeed be engaged in writing, even if it's only for self-promotion. The relationship then between these social media firms further illustrates how viable they are to a modern market. To cite the following statistic, during the average 20-minute period in 2010, there were approximately 15 million wall posts, 2.7 million photos uploaded, and 10 million comments on Facebook posted alone. But it's not just the kids that are being impacted by this phenomenon. For instance, 22% of Fortune 500 companies have a public-facing blog with at least one post in the past 12 months. As corporations change their media face, there will be a demand and increased personal presence on the web. You can see this in the manifestation of LinkedIn. Take, for example, the creation of the professional network concepts like that of LinkedIn. LinkedIn was originally started in the living room of founder Reid Hoffman in 2002. When it was launched on May 5, 2003, there were 4,500 members. As of November 3, 2011, there were 135 million professionals around the world who used the service. The correlation between the specific marketing niche as displayed in LinkedIn suggests that it could explain how social networking site usage grew 88% among internet users ages 55 through 64 between April 2009 and May 2010. Or 
it could be the mobile phone that's responsible for this phenomenon and information inundation. But regardless, mesmerization is abound, and it's being studied, studied in the critical theory of the humanities. For instance, G. Thompson's Mesmerization, which was published in 2008, focuses on trends, specifically the memification of cultural icons in the late 2000s. Thompson was the individual who coined the term digital domination, and he wrote a famous passage on blogs to cyberspace and beyond. He had noticed a trend in the liberation of mini media, or the social networking sites previously cited, like Facebook and its subsequent antecessor, Diaspora. Thompson wrote, few can have foreseen the impact of the digital domain. The web and mobile media on information, news and data, and now music, TV, and films. Even fewer would have predicted the social impact of user-generated content in cyber worlds such as Second Life, where truly alternative communities have created real dollar economies. He ultimately suggested in his research, yes, we have more information, but we also have more misinformation. The net result, conspiracy theories abound, we distrust government politics and big business. So it creates an interesting market wherein the attention is stratified upon the interest of interest itself. Lastly, Thompson questioned any prejudice or narrow worldview is endorsed not only by the few but by the millions. Can truth survive? Are they even relevant? To what extent do our current technologies correlate to social reproduction theory, or the idea that schools, among other institutions, prepare one for the market society? Scholar Tina Wildhagen also suggested that sociability influences the way that individuals must know how to mobilize culture to serve their interests, which is dictated by habitus. Habitus affects individuals' estimations of the probability of the success of particular outcomes, at the same time as it shapes individual tastes and preferences. Therefore, the conditions of current media are as follows. They are directly influenced by habitus, so we can assume that media is a congested entity. Remember the volume of Facebook posts. Media is a fluid entity. C. Thompson. And media has the power to shape our perceptions enough for us to question the nature of truth as well as define and redefine our individual interests through a stratified market. Therein, to make some predictions, I had to further consult the antiquity of classical theory. Walter Benjamin suggested in The Art of the Translator that the act of translation can be a tedious experience rather than a spontaneous experience, such as the expression of poetry. Benjamin said that all purposeful manifestations of life ultimately are displayed in a representation of its significance. And the struggle for the digital media artist, by extension, is not only to represent themselves within this medium, but to somehow promote themselves in a network which is all in itself self-promotional resources. The act of typing the social experience is an act of translation. You are changing the mediator of communication from the voice to the fingers. But, in all due respect, how does one establish spaces that foster fulfilling and dynamic experiences? enrich the community, and enable the artists to express themselves. Well, we don't know. But the business model is that with the help of some friends, we built a platform for individual artists where they could showcase their work. We addressed limitations in current media models that featured artists, recorded feedbacks, and made a unique cultural area on the internet that was evolving and dedicated to the heterogeneity of a university town. Users were taught how to access the site after they were given their own usernames and passwords with a low-budget YouTube film. The users were treated as professionals despite the measure of their critical success or in their previous publication. The users were published and their material was property of the site rather than a corporation. 
The site was non-profit, aside from the personal earnings that could be generated through a third-party exchange with a personal eBay store. That led to an opportunity for increased sponsorship. In the future, Kwame hopes to utilize all these surfaces to become a subscription-based service. One more thing. Why Kwame? Well, the former mayor of Detroit, Kwame Kilpatrick, recently spoke at Eastern Michigan University. Hundreds of people gathered to hear him narrate his versions of the events leading to his arrest and subsequent release. Clearly, as the figure of modernity, Kilpatrick represents the element in our collective society that wants to speak out on our own behalf, no matter how perilous the circumstances that compel us to articulate our concerns or how crowded the landscape. Why not use political marketing to draw attention to social networking concerns and, in this case, liberal motifs to the educated audience? Indeed, why not?